Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. My name is Chris Bailey, and I'm glad that you're going to spend a few minutes in the study of the word today. And if you are being blessed or have been blessed, we want to encourage you to visit our website. You also check us out on Facebook and YouTube at Change Ministry and uh, share this with someone else to bless their soul. Because what we're talking about today is vital to understanding what it means when Scripture uh, expresses the thought of us becoming as others are, especially in the goal of reaching them and the goal of appealing to them to accept Christ. What does that mean? And what is happening in this transition and what's not happening? That's what we want to understand today. And so, Lord, we want to pray now that you will speak to our hearts to understand the glory of reaching out to someone so that they might be brought to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our anchor text for the day and for the week, actually, is Galatians 4.12, which says, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. And so yesterday we dealt with the beauty of, of inviting others to be as we are. And we're able to do that because of God changing who we are. But he says, do this because I'm just like you. Well, what does that mean? And, and why is that what he appeals to in reaching out to help someone? Well, these are the anchor texts that we're going to refer to today. And so there's a lot to cover. So let's get to it. So when we look at our big three for the day, the first point that we want to understand is this. And that is that. People can't be us without love from us. When Paul is saying, be as I am, he is doing this after doing the greater work, not just calling people to change what they do. They've been actually able to see how much he loves them. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, he says, for though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Paul makes himself available. He sacrifices himself. And before we can ask anybody to sacrifice something that they do, we first have to show them how we have and we're willing to sacrifice who we are. Not what we believe, but to sacrifice our will, our time, our resources, our love, our compassion, our forgiveness. These are things we're willing to give for them in an appeal for them to give their heart to Christ. In 1 Corinthians, rather 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, he says, where we preach not ourselves. I'm not preaching about me, but I'm preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and ourselves, your servants, for Christ Jesus' sake. He's presenting himself as a servant because he has then obviously been doing what? Serving them. It's the invitation that is wrapped up in love that empowers someone to want to follow us as we follow Christ. It is love that laces every thought. It is love that scents every gift. It is love that even speaks when it speaks of structure and discipline. Even when love says no, love is the source of the no. And so if this is what happens or this is what even initiates the exchange, when Paul is saying, I am as you are, what is he saying? In Paul's terms, becoming someone is serving that someone. This is what it means to become someone. In Matthew 20, 26, the Bible says it this way, but it shall not be so among you. Jesus said, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. What is a minister? Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. A minister is not a Lord. A minister is not someone in charge. It's someone who is chief servant, someone who's first to serve, first to surrender. And this is when Paul is saying, this is what I've done for you. Brethren, I beseech you here in Galatians 4, be as I am. Why? Because I am as ye are. I have served. I am serving you. So follow my example. You've not injured me at all. Going over to 1 Corinthians 9, here's a verse that's widely read, but often misread. Paul says, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might do what? Gain the Jews. So to them that are under the law, I became as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as I became as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. You see, he, he clarifies that I might gain them that are without the law. In other words, I didn't stop keeping the law to gain those who are out under the law. In other words, I served them. I ministered to them in order so that they become like that they would become as I am a keeper of God's law to the weak. Verse 22, I became as weak 
that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men. Why? He says, I do this in verse 23 for the gospel's sake. I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to humble myself to serve you. But I am not doing what you do in order to win you. Paul's not saying in order to reach drunks, I became a drunk or in order to reach those who are who are illicit or, or who are promiscuous. I became promiscuous myself. No, he's saying I did not hold back or not serve those folks because of what their struggles were. But I served them so that I would inspire them to be as I am in the same way. In this graphic but powerful picture of this brother who's washing another brother who has no arms. In order to wash that brother, he said, I'm humbling myself. I'm coming to serve you to become as one who has no arms. I'm serving you with my arms. He's not saying in order to reach people with no arms, I myself have to become an armless man. That's crazy because what then ends up happening? Neither one of them washes. In the same way, I don't compromise my beliefs in order to reach an unbeliever. In fact, rather, I take the opposite approach. In fact, I realize that the persuasive power of my ministry is my conviction, not my compromise. In Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, the power of conviction Peter says, when I was dealing with Paul, who was acting wishy-washy, when the Jews came around and he started to mistreat the Gentiles, when Peter was come, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He was wrong. And it was the power of Paul's conviction that then empowered Peter to make the choice. And remember, you know, that's right. The gospel is a gospel of equity. And I'm not supposed to judge people. I can't call something clean that God has made unclean. And at the same way, I can't call a brother unclean who is clean in Christ Jesus. Conviction. Here in 1 Corinthians 8, when he's dealing with the issue of meats and meats dedicated to idols, meat committed us not to God. In other words, if you eat meat, it doesn't make you more holy. Neither if we eat are we the better. And if we don't eat it, it doesn't make us more holy either. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become as a stumbling block to them that are weak. What is he saying here? If I know someone is seeing me eat in verse 10 and they know this is food dedicated to idols, I will then confuse and embolden that brother to follow my faulty example. So going over in verse 11, he says, and through thy knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. In other words, if you know right, but you do wrong, you compromise when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience. You're actually singing against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make your brother to offend, if what you're going to do is going to make someone stumble, he's saying, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. If I know that my brother is of a weaker conscience, he's in a, in, a, in a place where that's where he where he is for his sake, I won't do it, even if I know and I have an understanding that's beyond his. I don't want to make my brother to stumble. I'm drawing a line in the stand to live by the convictions and principles and not just what's convenient for the sake of trying to win by compromise. See, he says in Acts 26, when he's speaking to, to King Agrippa and, and Festus is there in the midst, he thus speaks for himself. Festus says with a loud voice, Paul, you, you're mad. You're beside yourself. You learn too much. But he says to Festus, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. In other words, conviction. I will not compromise. For the king knows these things before whom I also speak freely. I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. And so then Paul says to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And King Agrippa says unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It was Paul's conviction and not Paul's compromise that inspires King Agrippa, even though he knows it's right. But because of his own convenience, he compromises while Paul is convicted. Friends, this is why we see the power of being a lighthouse and a lighthouse is only as meaningful as it stands tall. It has no value. It has no substance or purpose if it lays down. If it accommodates instead, it stands to let someone know that I'm here. There's hope. There's a future. There's a better way. And that's why God's calling us today to be convicted now more than ever. This is the last time, the, 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 the least 
opportune time to compromise when everyone's looking for someone and a way out. This is when we need to stand in Jesus Christ and be a light of love, serving others, serving them for their sake so that, that they might receive the salvation that we have. So with all that said, we got to wrap up. Lord, we got to wrap up and we want to understand tomorrow the whole point of then and now. What does that mean? We'll talk about it tomorrow. But today, let's all remember, friends, that in Jesus Christ, change is good. And if God has changed you, if God loves you and you know he does, and if God has redeemed you, let's live it.